Hello, everyone. Welcome to our live stream uh, for our astronomy classes. Um, and for those of you who are not in the classes, welcome to however you found us. Uh, my name is Matthew. I am one of the course staff uh, for the uh, astronomy classes uh, through Coursera and Udemy. And I'm going to hand this over to Professor Impey to welcome everyone, and then we will get right to your questions for today. Um, and the way that that works is you post those in the chat. Uh, uh, Victoria and I will grab those from the chat and give them to Chris. We try to go generally in order, but uh, we jump around to try and get a variety of topics and give as many people as possible a chance to ask questions. Um, and keep it at an intro level. We're not be able, uh, during the stream, we're not able to go into the details of uh, mathematics or, uh, you know, advanced hydrodynamics. So uh, just keep that in mind. All right, Chris. Okay, welcome everyone for the live session for the online courses. Um, so we'll just get started right away. All right, uh, Wendy Traver sent an email. If dark energy is viewed as part of the vacuum energy of space, does this mean that the vacuum energy varies in magnitude? Does dark energy vary in intensity over time? Um, it's not clear that dark energy is truly associated with the vacuum energy of space. So vacuum energy as a concept in physics is related to the fact that there's a small zero point energy um, that can be measured in the vacuum. You can draw that energy, you can measure it, turn it into pressure and detect it in the lab. Um, the vacuum energy is causing the accelerating expansion of the universe is fundamentally different. It's not that same energy that you can measure in the lab physics. Um, so it's not clear that they're related. They're very different orders of magnitude of strength. The best we know about dark energy that makes the universe accelerate in its expansion is from astronomical observations, which probe it on large scales. Uh, and in those measurements, it appears to have the same strength in every direction in space, and it appears not to change its strength, its absolute strength, with cosmic time. So even as the universe is getting larger and larger, the strength of the vacuum energy in any particular region of space is staying about the same. And again, that distinguishes it from the vacuum energy that we would measure it in the lab. So it's really still unknown what the physical nature of dark energy is. Um, Water the cow would like to know if they have found any aliens on Mars yet. I don't think so. They've got cameras working on Mars. Perseverance's cameras are all working. Its instruments are being powered up and seem to be all working. It hasn't started its science mission phase yet, but of course it's had a look around. We've seen published in the first few days a, a nice little panorama of the Martian surface. Um, so in those pictures, nothing untoward is seen, and I don't expect uh, Perseverance is going to see any living creatures on the surface of Mars, uh, because Mars is a sterilized planet, essentially, from the thin atmosphere and the high level of ultraviolet radiation and cosmic rays hitting the surface. Um, the next question is kind of a general one. Uh, what tools does Perseverance have to find microbes on Mars, and how will they determine if there was ever life on the planet? So Perseverance is not looking for microbes directly, uh, and it's not looking for genetic material directly. In principle, if you wanted to find uh, active genetic material on the Earth in small concentrations, you'd use a technique called PCR, uh, polymerase chain reaction, which is a method of amplifying small fragments of DNA or RNA, um, essentially getting them to replicate uh, self-replicate and, and grow enormously in the number of molecules. So that's a way of boosting trace concentrations of genetic material in the lab to measurable amounts. The Mars rover is not equipped with PCR technology or anything that directly looks for genetic material or nucleic acid chain molecules. It's going to be doing a slightly more indirect search for life. It's going to look at the chemical environment of the rocks it finds on the surface, and particularly the sedimentary rocks, which it is believed were laid down in a water environment a couple of billion years ago. And it's going to look for uh, geochemistry that's indicative of biology having been present in that rock, uh, microbial life forms. It is possible in principle that it could see um, microscopic or very small traces of microbial life, essentially the fossilized forms of 
life forms. Now, these are not body fossils with bones and skeletons, uh, but the microbe level fossils. When microbes get together in colony, colonies, uh, then we have the phenomena on Earth called stromatolites. And stromatolites are the first multicellular bacterial colonies that started on Earth about three and a half billion years ago. And they're still modern day versions of stromatolites. You can see them in Western Australia as the most famous example, Shark Bay. So it's possible that Perseverance may see morphologies that are indicative of stromatolites and then look at the chemistry of those rocks with its various spectroscopic techniques and infer that they were once biologically active material. That, that's the most direct evidence that Perseverance might get of former life on Mars. Uh, the next question is from an email. Christina Vislapu uh, asks, I have read that Jupiter has its reddish colors because the sun breaks methane into organic molecules and that Saturn does not have these vivid colors because it is much further from the sun. So how is it that Titan has uh, an orange haze? Um, yes, that's fairly accurate the way you put it, the difference between Jupiter and Saturn. Uh, Titan is uh, rich in methane and ethane. That's what the oceans, the lakes on Titan are made of. So it's for that reason that, and, and, cry, and Titan has cryovolcanism. So there's enough geological heating or tectonic activity within Titan to put energy into those cold, otherwise very cold lakes. And so that ethane and methane do move into the atmosphere, into a haze that mixes with the predominant nitrogen. And so it does have some of the same ingredients as the Jovian atmosphere does, and it's pinkish orange for the same reason, in fact. Excellent. Um, a related question is from Charlie Hollis, who's on with us live. You said in Coursera, you said in a Coursera video that the seas of Titan could hold, could host biochemistry, though any life would not be carbon-based. Why is the scientific consensus that a base other than carbon is highly unlikely, even if it is theoretically possible? Right. So to be a little more precise, the, the hydrocarbon, the ethane, methane lakes uh, on Titan do have other ingredients. Um, ethane and methane, of course, do not have carbon in those molecules. There's going to be some liquid water and ammonia mixed in with ethane and methane. And there's also carbon rich material, basically from the rocks on Titan, that will be dissolved in solution in those lakes. So there is some carbon material in those lakes, um, but these are not likely to be traditional, uh, the bi biochemistry that possibly could result, and that's extreme levels of speculation because no one knows a biology to form in such a strange chemical environment. Um, it would probably also need carbon too. There, there's nothing to beat carbon in the periodic table as the basis for long, stable, chain molecules that can hold a lot of information. And so doing biology, even alternative weird biology without carbon at all is extremely difficult to imagine. So I would think that if even if Titan had a strange form of biochemistry, it will still use carbon as the basis for information storage. The next question is from Astro Voyager, who would like to know what are the most sought after talents that will be needed in astronomy? Uh, so, for example, I guess they they mentioned string theorists, so that's more of a specialty. So maybe mm -hmm. what specialties and specific uh, uh, areas of expertise would be uh, needed in astronomy in the future? Yeah, that's a good question. Thinking of the future of astronomy, astronomy is sort of moving towards the very large collaborative projects, so you have to be working in a team. So, you know, uh, not traditionally true in astronomy, where there are a lot of individual investigators and solo astronomers, uh, the ability to work in a large complex team is is preeminent. But in terms of technical skills, uh, astronomers have to use computers all the time. They have to program to do their analysis and sometimes they have to run simulations. So the ability to do simulations uh, with computers, not necessarily supercomputers, but laptop computers even can do this now, is, is a skill that's in high demand because simulations are used in almost every area of astrophysics. Uh, another skill or talent that's very important in astronomy is the ability to build and understand and improve instruments and detectors. So astronomy is a discovery-based science 
And many of the discoveries historically have come from opening up new wavelength regimes for study or developing new types of instruments. And so um, the people who know how to do that, the people who understand how to build astronomical instruments and improve them and characterize them, are, are in very high demand. In fact, there's more demand for those people than there are people with the appropriate skills. In terms of core expertise in astronomy, the bulk of the subject matter these days in published work is, of course, now on exoplanets and galaxies and cosmology. Those are the two sort of active hot fields. And so people who have strong content knowledge in those are, either of those areas is, are going to be fairly employable. Um, the next question is from Planetary Terry, uh, who would like to know, uh, is there a higher chance of locating an exoplanet with an Earth-like mass where its stellar parent is higher in metal metallicity or lower? Um, this has been an interesting topic, looking at the metallicity of the star and then seeing what the incidence of planets around those stars is. There's an expectation, of course, that since planets have to be formed from the heavy elements left over when a star forms, the star being primarily hydrogen and helium, higher metallicity might indicate higher metallicity or heavy element abundance in the pre-stellar nebula that is going to be the material out of which the planets are formed. But the surveys of this have been somewhat contradictory. There have been uh, sort of almost opposing results. Some people find that high metallicity stars tend to have more or more likely to have a Earth-like planet or planets around them. And other studies, a few other studies have found no such thing. So at the moment, it's not clear what the correlation is between the metallicity or heavy element abundance of a star and its likelihood of having exoplanets of a particular size. Um, kind of related, Ox Bowman would like to know, um, they recently read about evidence in at least one forming system that planetary form formation may occur sim simultaneously with star formation, and, and meaning that they're siblings. Do you think this is typical or that it occurred in just this one observation? Well, it's the matter of the timing of star and planet formation is, is interesting because in principle, the process to form a star is extremely quick. Once the core of a protostellar gas cloud starts to collapse, it collapses on what's called the gravitational freefall time scale. So that means the material is literally free falling under the uh, flow of gravity at very high speed. And so it's a very fast process to collapse a star. Whereas planets, of course, the material has to settle into a, a proto, uh, you know, protoplanetary disk. And then by a process of accretion, you have to form planets. And that process is thought to take around 10 million years, although some have argued that it may only take a couple of million years, but that's still longer than the time it takes to form a star by a gravitational collapse. So the theory predicts that the planets form after the central star. There may, however, be situations, maybe depends on the angular momentum of the protostellar cloud and the angular momentum of the forming star, where the star formation uh, time scale is slowed down and those two time scales become equal. Um, Miri Switzerland says the universe is expanding as a result of gravity. One would expect that all matter would eventually concentrate into one central point. So why is this not happening? Well, it is happening, but not into one central point. So the, the history of the universe is a very interesting trade-off or tension even between um, the initial expansion, the impulse that was provided to the universe by the Big Bang, and then the subsequent formation of structures within the universe by gravity acting on what was initially smoothly distributed material. So in fact, the process of gravitational collapse and forming objects uh, is fighting against the expansion rate, because if the material thins out too fast, then gravity will never have sufficient strength to form a galaxy or a cluster of galaxies. Turns out that the expansion rate was slow enough that galaxies did form and clusters did form, but that process uh, did reach its peak billions of years ago and is now slowed down as there's less material to form stars and galaxies and clusters. So it's an interesting balance between the formation by gravity and the dissipation from the universal expansion. And of course, the condensation of mass by gravitational attraction is not going to occur just in one place. It's going to occur any time there's a sufficient overdensity 
to cause gravitational collapse. Uh, and that overdensity is going to happen all over the universe and throughout the expanding universe. And that's why the universe contains many uh, nucleations of matter, many galaxies, many clusters of galaxies, and even superclusters. Uh, the next question is from an email. Amrit Kaur asks, why are we focusing on Earth-like planets to find life in the universe? What if the other life forms in the universe, if there are some, do not need the same living conditions like ours to live? It's a fair point, of course, that by looking only at Earth-like planets or the most Earth-like as possible, we may be missing something important because we don't know the ver variety of conditions that could lead to biology and maybe life is more robust and diverse than we can imagine. It's just the natural first thing to do since at the moment the only planet we know of with life anywhere is the Earth. It seems fair initially in the early stages of a subject to look for objects like your own planet and so that's why people do that. Now that's still quite hard to do because Earth-like planets are in the small category of planets. But I think the people looking at exoplanets definitely consider that super-Earths are fair game for biology. And by a super-Earth, we mean objects that are two to three times the size or five to six times the mass of the Earth. There's no such thing as a super-Earth in our solar system. And yet it's a very abundant category in the exoplanet census uh, beyond the solar system. So there are a lot of super-Earths out there, and most astrobiologists think they might well be habitable. There are also clearly planets that are smaller than Earth. They're harder to find, Mars-like objects, and some of them may be habitable too, but it may, of course, depend on them having enough gravity to attract a significant atmosphere to shelter that life. So I think the opportunities for more biology are at the sort of higher end of the mass range of Earth-like terrestrial planets, ranging maybe up to two, three, or four times the size of the Earth. Uh, the next question is from Tian Escuto. If we imagine a person falling into a black hole and an observer at a safe distance, to the observer, the person falling into the black hole is slowing down because of time dilation. And when we have an object traveling close to the speed of light and an observer, time to the object would pass slower and the observed would see the object, or sorry, the observer would see the object pass super fast. So the question is why the experience is different for the two observers if the object or person that they are watching is experiencing times more slowly? It's a good question. And the answer really is the difference between special relativity and general relativity. In the situation of special relativity, where two objects are moving at a high relative velocity to each other, some good fraction of the speed of light, then the time, the clock of the fast moving object will appear to run slower than the clock of, of the observer, the, the other person. Uh, and their length will appear to contract in a Lorentz contraction, um, and their mass will appear to increase. Those are effects of special relativity, but they're reversible effects. So the observer and the other object moving at that fast speed will observe our time to run slower and, and our length to be contracted and our mass to be increased. That's special relativity. Gravity's not involved in that. It's just relative speeds of two different observers. In the black hole situation, all the effects are caused by gravity, not by general relativity. So the time dilation of an infalling uh, in falling person to a black hole seen by a stationary outside observer is entirely an effect of uh, uh, general relativity, not of their relative velocity. As the gravitational field of the falling in person increases, the gravitational redshift of their reflected radiation, the thing that would let you see them, uh, increases, uh, and the time in their local clock, the clock that would, they would have attached to them that you could might maybe read, will slow down. So those effects continue all the way to the event horizon when the redshift becomes infinite, i.e. no radiation can escape, because it's again fitting the definition of a black hole, and the time slows infinitely, essentially time freezing on the event horizon of a black hole. So those effects are both for general relativity and they're not related to the special relativity case. The next question is from Willy 138 uh, What do you think, uh, this is going to be an exciting year if all these launches uh, go as planned, what do you think we can expect to find from the James Webb Space Telescope? Um, it's interesting. It's going to take a while for it to shake down. So assuming it goes in October as planned, um, the Space Telescope, the James Webb Space Telescope, will have a couple of months of 
calibration, testing its instruments, and there's a few critical observations that it will conduct with each instrument uh, based on objects put forward by the teams that built the instruments. They get special privileges in the early days of an emission because they put all the work into building those instruments. So I will try and do some critical observations in the first few months. So it won't be until middle of next year before these the telescope is routinely taking observations for a wide variety of astronomers. We expect right from the start that the biggest contributions and most of the observations are going to be targeted at, at very faint and high redshift galaxies to look for the dawn of time, the, the dark ages when uh, the first galaxies formed as the universe cooled and expanded. And we also know that the telescope is going to be used to look at exoplanet signatures, in, in particular spectroscopic exoplanet signatures caused by absorption in the atmosphere of an Earth-like or super-Earth-like planet. So it's going to put a lot of its resources into those two types of science in the first year, and we could expect results within that first year. Photozone asks, can we tell with any certainty that the accelerating expansion of the universe is due to forces within the visible universe, or could it be due to an attracting force beyond our ability to image or see? Um, that's an interesting question, since we know that the observable universe, the distance to our horizon, the furthest we can see in the age since the Big Bang, roughly 14 billion years, we know that's not the totality of space-time. Because of the accelerating expansion and the fast, fact that the universe was expanding faster than light, there are regions of space outside the region we can see with our telescopes. And so it becomes a fair question of whether the properties of our universe are somehow influenced by the region beyond our universe. Now, there's a causal issue there because the universe is expanding uh, and has for some part of its history faster than the speed of light between any two points. And if you go far enough outside our horizon, the region of space time we can see, you have the same situation where regions of space are moving away from each other faster than light. The inability for causality to work really takes away the possibility that something beyond our visible universe is imprinting what we see in our universe. It really does look that whatever is going on with dark energy and the accelerating expansion was built into the Big Bang event itself. The next question is from L. Ravi uh, Narasaman, um, who sent an email. With the tremendous advances in space and ground-based infrared astronomy, Shouldn't we have direct observational evidence for or against the existence of the Oort cloud by now? Um, it's actually very difficult to observe the Oort cloud um, because you have to realize the, the scale of what we're trying to do there with detecting it. We see comets when they make their transient journeys into the inner solar system, if, if in fact they do, they're a substantial number. The majority of comets actually never come into the inner solar system where we can see them. So when we're talking about the Oort cloud, we're talking about a set of hypothetically hundreds of billions, perhaps a trillion objects that are so far from any source of light or radiation that they're completely dark. They're essentially small, three to 10 kilometers in size, and they're at enormous distances, distances of tens of thousands up to maybe 50,000 astronomical units. So you're talking about objects that are much smaller than a planet that are thousands of times further away and therefore millions of times fainter uh, visibly than a planet. And so that means they're impossible to detect. So there's no way with any telescope we can actually see the individual comets of the Oort cloud. We essentially have to infer the existence of the cloud based on the subset of the comets that actually come into the inner solar system and their orbits. Now, it's the tip of an iceberg of comets that we're inferring the bulk of the population from. And so there's a lot of uncertainty about the, the nature of the Oort cloud, how many comets it contains, what the distribution of maximum distances is. There's really quite a lot of uncertainty, and it's very hard to make direct observations of it. The next question is from Carthy, Kenya, uh, Carthy Kean, who uh, asks, why is Mars specifically important to NASA's research? Mars is important particularly to NASA, but just generally to planetary scientists, um, because it is the most likely planet in the solar system to have had life. Uh, not because of its conditions now, but because all the models 
we know of and all the evidence of its surface suggests that it was warmer and wetter in the past and had standing bodies of water, substantial standing bodies of water, seas. Um, so the fact that Mars could have been a living planet billions of years ago and that that evidence of its living nature, its biological nature, might still be there on the surface for us to inspect and understand makes it a compelling target. The other reason it's a compelling target is that it's close, it's relatively close for getting a spacecraft to. Um, and because it has a very thin atmosphere, that, that causes some problems for some type of spacecraft, but it, it makes uh, using spacecraft fairly easy. If you had a thick atmosphere like Venus to work with, you'd, you'd have real trouble communicating with or, and, and it would be impossible to see your spacecraft. So Mars is attractive for all of these reasons. Um, it also had a place in the cultural history of astronomy and the history of ideas and the history of Greek myths and gods and legends and so on that make it attractive to the general population. So for all these reasons, the fact that it worked its way into science fiction, uh, starting with H.G. Wells and then through the classic science fiction of the 1950s, Ray Bradbury and so on, um, means that Mars pretty much has a special place in the popular imagination too. Uh, the next question is maybe Earth science, but also related to Mars. Um, not really winter would like to know how a tornado forms, and maybe you can talk about how those dust devils on Mars form. Right. So um, dust devils on Mars are well-studied phenomena. All of the rovers have seen them and been able to record them. Uh, but, and of course, there are tiny versions of much larger storms and systems that occur on Mars. Um, well, you know, the circulating patterns in any atmosphere are influenced by the rotation of the planet due to the Coriolis force. So there's a there's a preference in the directionality of large storms on the Earth or on any planet with an atmosphere. And so even the smaller scale uh, disturbances manifest this uh, this effect. And so when you have an eddy, when you have a thermal disturbance on the surface and, and convection, rising heat, there's a likelihood that it's going to have some net rotation, and that net rotation gets amplified as the dust devil forms, and so you end up with you know, a sort of funnel of material, in this case dust whipped up from the surface and taken to high altitude. It's exactly the same phenomena that happens on the Earth with water spouts or with tornadoes on the Earth or even with dust devils on the Earth. So the physics is actually the same on Mars and on the Earth. Uh, the next question is from an email. Do you find credence in the recently reported news that about 42,000 years ago, the Earth's magnetic poles flipped, which led to massive extinctions like that of the Neanderthals and lots of megafauna? Yeah, I've read this paper. It's a very interesting study. And, and I think the evidence, the geomagnetic evidence for this is, uh, is quite convincing. So there is, a, there is the ability um, using strata of rock that are very clearly laid down and magnetic domains of crystals naturally forming within that rock to track the orientation of the planetary magnetic field over time through the strata of rock, especially when they're deposited in a sort of uniform and linear way with sediments. And so this kind of data uh, gathered from a number of places on the world do definitely allows you to track uh, reversals in the magnetic field or situations where the magnetic pole wanders substantially, which seemed to be the case here. So the Earth essentially got amnesia about 42,000 years ago uh, and lost its sense of magnetic field. And in that time of losing its magnetic field, the magnetic pole wandered substantially, substantial fraction of the surface of the Earth, uh, and then eventually reformed. In the period of time when the Earth's field had dissipated, essentially, the Earth lost its shielding against high energy radiation and cosmic rays. And that led to apparently devastating effects on the flora and fauna of the Earth because it would increase the mutation rate, it would cause uh, cellular damage and, and actually, you know, death almost directly by high energy radiation to some species. And so that's the speculation. The paper is interesting because the paper pulls together unusually, because scientists tend to stick within their silo or their discipline. This paper pulls from a lot of different types of evidence. It pulls from geology, from biology, from paleontology, uh, and 
anthropology, you know, looking at the effect of humans because early humans were around. And of course, it looks at the fossil record. So it's a pretty interesting piece of scholarship. It's slightly controversial because it's making a fairly grand claim, but I think the evidence they present in that paper is, is pretty good. Um, the next question is from Aquarius Francine, who's on with us live. <coughs> Perseverance has been big news lately. Why can't our scientists invent a lab to perform experiments um, that we now have to wait a couple of years maybe for? We have spent time and money on it, so why not have the rover do the experiments right there on Mars? So the trouble with the, the strength and the limitation of the Mars rovers, and remember these rovers, uh, Curiosity and then Perseverance, are, are much larger than the rovers that preceded it. The first Mars rover from the mid-1990s was a Sojourner, and that was just the size almost of a child's toy. It was really small. Then we had Spirit and Opportunity, which were sort of the size of go-karts. And now, a decade or two decades later, we have uh, objects that are the size of an SUV, basically. They're quite substantial vehicles. Despite that, despite the increase in the size and mass of the technology and the instruments aboard, what those rovers can do is a still a small fraction of what you could do in a lab on the Earth. In a lab on the Earth, if you had a single Mars rock, you could put it in a clean room and in a very safe and non-contaminating uh, way, you could dissect it and look at it through the layers of all the rocks. You could look at it essentially molecule by molecule. Those machines to do that are weigh tons on the earth. They take up a whole lab. And there's no way you can miniaturize that technology and put it on a rover. So there's always going to be a need or a requirement or a demand, if you like, for Mars rocks to be brought back to the Earth, because the things you can do with Mars rocks or Mars samples on the Earth are so much more sophisticated than you can do even with these very clever rovers. And as you know, the uh, Perseverance rover is now part of a strategy for uh, staging samples. It's going to take, it has a special uh, device to hold core samples, and it's going to deposit, I think, 10 different core samples at a place for subsequent return to the Earth, but probably not for eight or 10 years from now. Mark Laufenberg asks, what are the steps needed to form a galaxy? Well, galaxies are huge objects. They're, you know, of order a million light years across. And when they form, they're more diffuse gas clouds that are even larger, maybe 10 times larger. So millions of light years across of diffuse gas and dust. The formation of galaxies is, is a process really only understood by simulations. It's, this is a large enough volume of space and the details are complex, so you have to essentially model it. At some level, there will be a straight gravitational collapse. So a nearly spherical, slightly rotating gas cloud will collapse uh, into a disk-like formation, and that's how you would get a spiral galaxy. But if it's nearly spherical, then the outer parts of that cloud as it collapses will form stars right away. And those stars will become what would be the halo of an elliptical galaxy or, may see, or most of an elliptical galaxy or the halo of a spiral galaxy. So it seems like depending on the angular momentum of the initial huge cloud of gas and dust, you either get the rudiments of a spiral galaxy or the rudiments of an elliptical galaxy. That's one aspect. But the other aspect is that galaxies do not get the way they are in the old universe now right away. They get there in stages. So the Milky Way has formed, been formed by accretion, slow accretion from intergalactic space since it initially formed, and also by mergers of smaller galaxies and maybe occasionally larger mergers. And so every galaxy has this complex history of mergers and accretion that follow on from its initial formation, which means after 13 billion years, uh, it could bear very little resemblance to the first object that gravitationally collapsed. Uh, the next question is from David Learning, um, who would like to know if you uh, can talk about the status of the GTO sat satellite for studying the Van Allen radiation belts. Um, do you know its current status and what they hope to discover? Um, I don't know its current status. I haven't seen an update on that recently, but the satellite is designed to, um, you know, continue to answer questions about the Van Allen radiation belts. These these belts. Uh, that surround the Earth 
um, were of course found in the first part of the 20th century, actually. Van Allen was a, a plasma physicist, I think. I think he worked for NASA too, um, who, who gave his name to these belts of radiation. So high energy particles trapped in the Earth's magnetic field, responsible for various energetic phenomena. And what's of course not totally known is what are the energy mechanisms by which particles get accelerated in the Van Allen belt and therefore emit some of this radiation. Uh, it's not known how the energy is injected into the Van Allen belts to keep them, to keep those particles energized at the level they are. So there's some mysteries of particle acceleration. There's mysteries about how the magnetic field plays into the visibility of the belts and their emissivity. Uh, and, and just generally how they form in the first place. Uh, the next question is from Smyana, uh, Smyana. Could you explain a little bit about the idea of the cosmic bounce? The cosmic bounce is a, an idea in cosmology that the universe, uh, having had an expanding phase, might have a contracting phase and then uh, set up a second Big Bang, essentially, or potentially an oscillating universe where this repeats over and over again. Um, the likelihood or existence of this bound phase is now controversial because we see no evidence in the universe we live in, which is expanding at an accelerating rate, that the universe ever had a previous phase. And people have argued, theorists have argued, um, that is actually unlikely to have an oscillating universe uh, because entropy, despite the compression into a singularity or big bang state, if you do that sequentially over and over again, entropy actually increases through the bounce. And so it then becomes a hard thing to explain why the overall entropy of the universe is actually quite low compared to what it could have been. Since if we were in a bouncing universe, you'd have to presume somehow that we're at the beginning of this phase, which is a special time in the history of the universe. So it gets a little arbitrary and artificial, and for various reasons, people don't think the bounce universe is viable. It's also unlikely that the accelerating expansion will ever stop, and so the universe, as we currently see it, will just continue to get larger and larger forever and will not return to a dense state. You're muted, Matthew, maybe. I apologize, I missed the button on my console, thank you. Um, the next question is, uh, at one point there was a plan for an essentially a, a high-speed uh, transmission satellite between Mars and Earth, um, and that project was canceled uh, due to budget constraints. Do you know if there is any kind of plan for a high-speed data link uh, to Mars uh, in the future, or when we might be able to expect something like that? Um, yes, there is, there is a plan. It's it's a little broader than just Mars. Mars is getting a lot of traffic, as we see, several space missions there right now, and many more in the future. But NASA and the other space agencies are thinking more broadly. Um, they're basically thinking of an interplanetary internet, not just a fast data link to Mars, because in the long run, we plan to be exploring the solar system. Uh, we're gonna, we have missions that are gonna head back to places like Europa and hopefully Titan and Enceladus and then even further out in the solar system. So that creates a requirement for sort of a high speed data infrastructure throughout the solar system. And that means a set of satellites, a set of uh, probes, space probes, uh, equipped with very efficient and compact transmitters that can relay signals around the solar system. Now this will probably be tested out in this situation for Mars, which makes sense since Mars is gonna get a lot of traffic, but the really the plan is to have dozens of these uh, staging transmitters uh, to propagate the internet and it's useful for timekeeping and synchronizing signals and so on um, that will eventually be deployed throughout the inner and the outer solar system. Time scale for this is of course a couple of decades. Um, Asha Bea 21 would like to know if you have any thoughts on intuitive physics. Um, I, I, it sounds like the idea that the universe is predetermined merely unfolding as a block universe. Um, uh, anyway, what, what are your, do you have any thoughts on this? Are you familiar with the concept? 
Yeah, there's there are ideas in physics. They're they're a little uh, frontier, I would say, speculative. Um, that there are aspects of the universe uh, where you know some of the things, some of the things that happen may be sort of preordained, or take place in this almost deterministic way. Um, and this is related to you know fundamental laws of physics, which which have uh, time a time symmetry. Uh, in which you can play the physics backwards and forwards. And so you should be able to predict the future state of the universe. Um, I don't know that how intuitive physics actually relates to that. That's not a familiar term with me relating to the block universe. Um, but there's a speculative area of astrophysics that involves sort of deeper meanings in the history of the universe and whether uh, it's understandable when we play it into the far future using our known laws of physics. Also speculative, Mr. Cristiano would like to know, uh, could there be a link between consciousness and the expansion of the universe? That is uh, definitely speculative. And I think uh, astronomers are not really privy to understanding consciousness in any detailed way. We see consciousness as a phenomena of certain life forms on the earth. We don't know if consciousness exists beyond the earth in other biological settings. Every now and then people talk about the fact that the universe is a large, coherent, complex entity might display consciousness. That's got a new age flavor to it, and there's no physics theory that would lead that to be understandable. So I don't really think most astronomers or astrophysicists credit the idea of a conscious universe because we don't understand consciousness as it relates to biological organisms on the Earth, let alone the idea of a superorganism based on the scale of the universe. So I, I think that's uh, that's almost beyond the level of speculation into pseudoscience. Uh, Photozone would like to know if the speed of light is the limiting speed in our theory of physics in the universe, how can the universe be expanding faster than the speed of light? And then a follow-up question after that. Um, sure, it seems like a good question because the speed of light is a limit as we've learned, but that is, the theory of special relativity, which relates to sending signals and synchronizing clocks and doing what we would call terrestrial or lab physics. Uh, and that indeed is a limit. We have no way and we found no way to send signals faster than the speed of light. It appears to be an absolute limit. However, the universe as a whole, as a space-time entity, is governed by general relativity. And general relativity describes expanding space-time, and there's nothing built into general relativity that puts a speed limit on the expansion of space-time. Space-time can expand, it can contract, it can accelerate in its expansion as our universe seems to be doing, but there's no speed limit built into the expansion rate of space-time. So, so no physics is violated because the universe as a whole is governed by general relativity, not special relativity. Uh, the next question is, <clears throat> let's see here. Um, in what areas um, can quantum computing help us in astronomy or in studying the, oh, I'm sorry, I, I forgot. There was a follow-up question to that one. Um, so um, Photozone would just like a, a clarification um, with this uh, faster than light expansion does this mean that the expansionary period that began microseconds after the Big Bang is still continuing in today's universe? Um, no, that's a good question. And it's important to sort of clarify that the cosmology we believe applies to our universe involves two periods of extremely rapid expansion. The first is the inflationary phase, which occurs in the first tiny fraction of a second. Uh, and that, we believe, is an exponential expansion for a very short interval of time that's triggered by the uh, dissolve dissolution of the super force of all force of forces of nature into uh, gravity and a grand unified force of the other three forces. The mechanism and the agent of that accelerating expansion inflation is not known, but it's associated with the fundamental forces of nature. The accelerating expansion that occurs in the later universe is due to the properties of the vacuum and is attributed to something that we will call dark energy. So that's it's fundamentally different from inflation because it's something that's present through space and through time and doesn't actually change by position in space or over time. 
Uh, and that's a right, quite a different phenomenon. We'll have a different physical basis, we think. Um, the next question is from Chips and Churro. How can very large structures in space, such as the Hercules Corona Borealis Great Wall, be compatible with the cosmological principle? That's a good question. So the cosmological principle is the idea that the, our region of the universe is not special, and more particularly that the universe is both homogeneous and isotropic. Isotropic means the same in every direction, and we can count galaxies to very faint levels in every direction, and we see no difference in the average numbers of galaxies and their properties. So the universe is definitely isotropic. Homogeneous is harder to test. That means the universe is roughly, on average, the same at different locations in space. Now, we're trapped on the Earth and in our galaxy, so we can't travel to distant regions of space. And even when we look at those distant regions of space, we're looking back in time, so we're not comparing uh, far off places in space with our universe nearby now, we're comparing those spaces as they were before. So it's a tricky comparison. However, it does seem that homogeneity applies too. The question of what are the largest structures that are consistent with the cosmological principle and that assumption of homogeneity is that you can definitely have structures that are several hundred million light years across, such as the Great Wall, such as the the supercluster that the questioner named, and other superclusters. And as long as those are not high contrast or, or sharply delineated in density features in the galaxy distribution, it is plausible for them to have been formed in 14 billion years of slow gravitational uh, exertion of, of inhomogeneities growing slightly larger and propagating to larger and larger scales. So these are structures that uh, are push up against the cosmological principle, but they don't actually violate it. If we see highly contrasted structures in terms of their mean density on scales of about a 500 million light years, half a gigaparsec, um, then you would have a violation of the cosmological principle. So at the moment, it's okay. Um, the next question is, in what areas um, could quantum computing be helpful in studying astronomy or the universe? Quantum computing, uh, the ability to convey information, not just in the standard ones and zeros of bits, but in qubits, which are uh, correlated ones and zeros. So the ones and zeros, the digital information is held coherently in a mixed uh, state, quantum state. That is the ability to parallelize computing at a fundamental level and accelerate the speed of computers by orders of magnitude. So quantum computing is a complete game changer in computation, um, really increasing the speed of computers dramatically. At the moment, quantum computers are quite limited and small. They, they just don't have very many uh, operating elements, and so they can't take over the kind of things we do with computers in the normal manner. If they get more powerful, then, of course, they'll play into astronomy, just as they'll play into every field. I mean, machine learning, artificial intelligence will probably get the most dramatic benefit of quantum computing, but it will also affect telecommunications or electronic devices, and, and it'll impact astrophysics, too, because astrophysics has some of the most computationally challenging problems there are, in particular simulations of uh, large-scale structures or black holes or the universe itself use heavily parallel uh, processing and heavily parallel algorithms, and those are perfect for quantum computers. So quantum computers will make huge impacts on our ability to simulate large chunks of the universe. USMC uh, asks, are there any good hypotheses for something happening before the Big Bang? There are no good hypotheses. There are definitely ideas. They're not testable hypotheses, however, to elevate it to a sort of level of conventional science. The hypothesis that's sort of on the table and has been for a while is the idea of a quantum genesis of the universe, that the universe was at, at one level a quantum state and that it emerged from that quantum state to go through its inflationary phase and then a more sedate expansion that we see now. Um, and from that quantum genesis, you can imagine the quantum creation of other spacetimes, other universes. That's the multiverse idea. And so that's a speculation that people say 
uh, could apply to the Big Bang, and that would stop the Big Bang being the beginning of absolutely everything and just make it the beginning of the space-time that we occupy. Um, it's an untestable hypothesis at the moment, although people are working hard on figuring out ways that it might be testable. Um, the next question is from an email who would like to know um, if we, what would happen, um, or it would, it, is it possible to observe the atmosphere of Pluto uh, shrinking and expanding um, as it moves closer to and further away from the sun? Um, no, not directly. The at Pluto is a very small planet, a dwarf planet, of course, um, very far from the Earth, 40 or 50 astronomical units. And it has this extremely thin atmosphere. So it's, it's not negligible, but it's extremely thin. Uh, and without space probes, a New Horizon probe visited briefly and then sped on out to the through the edge of the solar system. Without any direct uh, nearby probes, we have no ability to track um, the atmosphere of Pluto, we'd have to send a space probe out there and turn it into an orbiter to have that detail level of information. When observed through ground-based telescopes, it's very hard to get detailed information on Pluto. It's, it's so far away and it's so physically small. And certainly the only information you get from the atmosphere observed from the Earth with a telescope is its basic composition and that's all. No sensitivity to look at variations, basically. Uh, Jan Campos would like to know, if dark matter interacts with gravity, why doesn't it form its own structures similar to planetary systems? Well, it does. So dark matter operates uh, according to gravity. It feels gravity. It does not experience the electromagnetic force, we think, and that's why, of course, we don't see it. It doesn't absorb, scatter, or emit light. But it does feel gravity, and so over the history of the universe, the dark matter that was originally very smoothly distributed, as we see the microwave background, smooth to one part in 10 to the 5, one part in 100,000, and that's pretty similar to how smoothly the dark matter was distributed then too. It has gradually clustered according to gravity, so it, it is self-gravitating, if you like. It feels its own gravity, and that means that it has turned into an undulating density of dark matter where it's concentrated at some level, and those large concentrations become the halos for the galaxies. The galaxies themselves are much smaller, the visible parts, because the normal material, the non-dark matter, uh, is able to lose energy, dissipate energy, and therefore collapse and form stars. And so you have a small stellar system at the center of a large dark matter halo. The dark matter halo, though, does have a cluster, does have structure. It is more sensually concentrated than it is at the edges. It's just not as dramatic as the visible material in the universe. Uh, we get this question periodically, and we have it uh, again from an email. Um, uh, and they would like to know if you have any favorite books uh, that you like to read or that you like to recommend for um, learning about astronomy. Yeah, um, I mean, there's so many. It's uh, You can check out the New York Times bestseller list or actually uh, Sky and Telescope and Astronomy Magazines, I think, do annual summaries of good books overall in astronomy. Um, so this is a hard question to answer because because essentially there are so many. You can uh, look for your favorite writers, for example. Neil deGrasse Tyson almost always has a book about every year or so. So he's an obvious choice. Um, there are other people who write books less frequently, but they've had you know uh, great books in the past. Timothy Ferris, one of my favorite writers. Uh, he's written about six or seven astronomy books in total. Um, and so uh, you know, I think you just have to look at the bestseller lists and see what ranks highly among the science books because the choice is, is pretty large out there. I'm writing a book on exoplanets myself. That'll be my eighth. I think my ninth book, actually. Indeed, I want to recommend all of your books. Um, we're doing a book reading on this channel on Mondays, and that's uh, Victoria is doing that. And um, uh, I, I don't remember which one they're working on now, um, but um, she can probably pop on and tell us which one um, which one is happening on Mondays. But then um, I also want to remind everybody that there's going to be a, um, a special subscriber-only uh, stream on Tuesday 
where uh, um, where you will be answering some questions online that are you know and talking about your sort of career and interests and how you got into astronomy and maybe talking about some of the fun things in your office. Um, and so, but that uh, so anyone will be able to watch that stream, but only subscribers will be able to ask questions. Um, so if you'd like to participate in that stream, make sure you subscribe to our Twitch channel. Um, the um, that brings us kind of to our last question, um, and um, that it is uh, it's from Hamid Mazuji, and the question is: Is it possible to create a universe by detecting the waveform? And I think what they mean by this is that there's often talk about particles coming into existence when you um, have a collapsing waveform. You know, this is one of the interpretations of, of uh, particle physics. So can you, or, or uh, quantum mechanics, can you talk about what a collapsing waveform means and, you know, if that could be sort of applicable to an entire universe? Right. So the, the idea of a collapsing waveform or collapsing wave function is, is more often said in quantum theory. Uh, it's a basic premise of uh, quantum physics that the probability that a particle is not a point-like entity with sharp edges in a perfectly defined location, but it's a uh, probabilistic distribution. It's a distribution of energy and density in space, across space. And so a particle has a probability distribution. Sometimes a quantum system could be in two possible states, and it oscillates between those two states. The collapse of the wave function occurs when we observe the system. And when we observe the system, given the qualities of our observing equipment, then we do identify and localize the position of that system. And so what was a fuzzy probability distribution turns into a precise number, which is the place we measure it, or the energy we measure it to have, or the momentum we measure it to have. And so this collapsing of the wave function is what happens when we make a measurement of a system that is fundamentally and normally defined by a probability distribution. There's no real evidence or sense that the universe itself could have this character. Um, we observe the universe and we do disturb it, of course. We disturb everything that we observe. But our ability to disturb the universe from its underlying state by observation of it is, is minuscule. And so it's really hard to believe that there's a universe scale version of a collapsing wave function. It's an interesting idea, but I think it doesn't quite fit the physics of the moment. Um, thanks for the questions. It's a good variety as always, and we'll be announcing our next two sessions and be back with you next week. And then there are the special sessions that Matthew mentioned. So thanks to him for facilitating and Vicki and Alexander behind the scenes too. All right, take care everyone. Have a great uh, have a great rest of the week and we'll see you on Friday for the live uh, for the amateur astronomy stream. Take care.